Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this session on Java on Crack. Now, I think in terms of the marketing of this particular thing, we may need to have a little bit of a think about the, the branding, but this is quite an interesting subject, I think. Um, we're going to be talking about the idea of how we can take a running Java application, pause it, and then restart it again at some point later and do that in a controlled way. So my name is Simon Ritter, I work for Azul, I'm the Deputy CTO, and I'm being joined today by my colleague Gerrit, who will be doing a demo later on. So the first thing that we need to think a little bit about is why is Java so popular? And there are a number of reasons why we could consider to be, you know, Java is one of the top three programming languages in all of the surveys that you see being done by different people like TOB or Redmonk or whoever. And so one of those reasons is it's a great language. Okay, it's easy to write, it's easy to read. More, even more important than writing it is reading the language. And so that's one reason why we could say that Java is popular. We could also say that we have a huge selection of libraries to choose from. Literally anything you can think of, you can find library, either commercial or open source, that will help you to do that. And you can say that there's a great community around that as well. The fact that we're here at this conference, we have Java user groups, we have Java champions, we have all sorts of different things that happen in the community. And it's very easy to find Java programmers. So these are all reasons why you could consider Java to be very popular. But I think the reason that Java really is maintaining its popularity is the Java virtual machine. This is the thing that really gives us the power when it comes to Java. And you know, if you go right back to the beginning of the launch of Java, and I remember this because I used to work for Sun. Look, I'm even wearing a Sun shirt today. Uh, we had this catchy phrase, write once, run anywhere. You take your byte codes and you compile into those byte codes and you can take those and run them wherever you've got the Java virtual machine. No recompilation, no worrying about those things. The other thing that the JVM gives us is excellent backwards compatibility. You can literally take code that was compiled on JDK 1.2 and run it on JDK 18 without having to recompile it. There's not many languages that you can do that with. And the most important thing, we have a managed runtime environment. That's where the power really comes. That doesn't come without a cost, though. And one of the things we see is the idea of applications warming up. Because when you start running a Java application, what you're dealing with is bytecodes, all very logical, and these are the instructions for a virtual machine, hence JVM. Now, the way that works is that we initially we take those bytecodes and we interpret them, meaning that we take each bytecode and we convert it into the necessary system calls or native instructions for whichever platform we're running on. But the problem is that there's no optimization of that. We literally take each instruction, convert it as we need it, and if you look at the details of this, the only optimization is sometimes you'll find that two byte codes get coalesced into one set of instructions. But that really is the only optimization that happens there. So this is very inefficient and it's very slow. So what we now do, since JDK 1.2, is we look for sections of code, methods, which get executed frequently. We do that simply by counting how many times you call different methods. And we identify those as being hotspots, hence the name of the JVM. When we find a hotspot, a method that we use frequently, we pass it to the just-in-time compiler. The just-in-time compiler then turns that into the native instructions for that particular platform, and we don't have to interpret each bytecode time and time again. And if you look at the details of how Hotspot works, you'll find that there are two JIT compilers. There's C1 and C2. C1 is a compiler that compiles very quickly to give you that code so that you can run it straight away. But it doesn't optimize particularly. What we then do is we follow that method, we profile it, we see how it's being used, and then when it gets to another threshold, in terms of the number of times it's called, we pass it to the C2 JIT compiler, and we recompile it, but this time we spend a lot more effort in optimizing the code so that we can get even better performance out of that. This is good, 
But there is a problem. Each time we start the application, we go through the same process again every time. So we have to look for those hot methods. We then have to compile them with C1. We have to profile them. Then we have to recompile them with C2 and so on. Start the application again, you do the same thing again. Very inefficient in that respect. And if we look at a, a graph of performance of the JVM, so this is how our application code is running in terms of overall performance. This is the type of thing we're going to see. We start off very slowly, interpretive mode, we gradually compile methods with C1, we compile methods with C2, and then we get to our steady state of maximum level of performance for this application. And we know that the time it takes to get to that level is called the warm-up. Now, if we look at that in terms of running the same application, as I said, what we suffer from is no ability to remember what's happened in the past. You run the application, it goes through this process. You run it a second time, it goes through the same process. You run it a third time, it goes through the same process. Very inefficient, there must be a better way of doing this. Because what we would really like to see in terms of this particular sort of approach is start the application, let it run till it's warmed up, but then the second time we start it up, we remember what we did on the previous instance, and so we get the same level of performance straight away. Then, if we start it up again, we get the same level of performance. Wouldn't that be a much better way of doing it? If we haven't changed the code, if we haven't changed the way the application is being used, then this would be an ideal situation for our performance. Well, there are a couple of ideas that people have had about how we can improve things. And the first of those is App CDS, Application Class Data Sharing. When you start up your application, there is a main entry point, a class that you need to load to run your application. And that will then load a sequence of other classes. Now, from the point of the JVM, that will go through the process of loading classes and optionally initializing those classes. You don't have to initialize all the classes you load. But what it will do is it will load the classes, it will create internal data structures that represent what that class is, the code, the state, the variables, and so on, and store those within the JVM. Now, what we can do with application, application class data sharing is to say, right, we've loaded all those classes, we've initialized those classes, why not just make a copy of the internal data structures that are being used there, write it out to a file? When we start the application again, we can then simply map that back in to the JVM and say, right, we've got all the information that we have for those classes straight away. We eliminate the overhead of doing the loading. We eliminate the overhead of doing the class initialization. Those structures are ready to go straight away. So this certainly improves startup time, as in reduces the amount of time it takes to get your application up and running a bit. But it's certainly not the answer to all of the problems that we've got. It'll make a little bit of a difference, but not a huge amount. The next thing that we can talk about is the idea of ahead of time compilation. Now, if you think about traditional languages, C, C++, what we do there is rather than compiling them into bytecodes, we compile them into instructions for a particular platform. So we take our C application, we compile it for Windows running on Intel, we compile it for Linux running on ARM. But the instruction set is fixed for that particular architecture. So this is static compilation, very traditional approach to creating executables. The advantage of this is that we don't have the problem of having to interpret bytecodes. So we're immediately getting much faster performance because we're immediately executing native instructions. The other thing we don't have to do is we don't have to ana analyze the code that we're running. We don't have to look for these hotspots. We don't have to track how many times methods are called. All that work just goes away. We don't have to do any runtime compilation of our code. So not only do we not have to count how many times we need methods, we don't have to go through the process of compilation, which means we're reducing the overhead that we place on the CPU that's running the application. 
when we use JIT compilation, we're clearly sharing our CPU resources in terms of running the application and compiling the code at the same time. If we use ahead of time compiling, then we don't have that overhead. So we're running all of the resources that we have available purely for the application code. So this is all really good. We start at full speed. We start straight away. There's no warm-up time associated with this. So you would think to yourself, great, this solves all my problems. Let's just switch to static compilation and use ahead of time compilation. And this is what Graal does. So if you've seen the Graal VM and you've looked at the idea of native images, this is effectively what they do. They simply say, let's take the Java code, compile it into a set of native instructions, have that executed from the beginning as native code, eliminate all of those problems above. So that should be the end of this presentation because we've solved everything we've brought. Mm, except we haven't quite. Problem solved? Maybe not. Not so fast. And in fact, this is really what we're going to talk about. Because ahead of time compilation is, by definition, static. It does not change. So you compile your code, and you're running whatever code you have compiled. And the code is compiled before you run it, which means that you have absolutely no information about what is happening at runtime. And this is really important because the compiler has no knowledge of what the code's going to do when it actually runs. It can obviously analyze paths through the code that you create, but it's got no idea of seeing well, what is actually going to happen when the code is being used. Now, there is a, a sort of a, a kind of approach to solving that problem, which is called profile guided optimization. It's been around, you know, really since the beginning of static compilation. The idea there is that you compile your code with the static compiler, then you run it, but you profile the code as it's running. And that way you can then take the information of the profile, feed it back into the compiler, recompile the code with some knowledge about what happens at runtime so that you could optimize based on that information. Great. Except that's still static. It means that the only profile you've got is for whichever run of the application that you use to generate that profile. And if your application usage changes, as it may well do, then you've got no ability to adapt to that. So this is, is still static, even though it's getting some more information about what might happen at runtime. So in JIT compilation, the thing that we can really take advantage of, one of the most, um, the, the best things that we can do in terms of improving performance is called speculative optimization. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this to, to help you understand why this is very important. I have a class called Animal, and Animal encapsulates some information, which in this case is color. So I'm doing that, I'm encapsulating it, I've got an accessor method to that to get color. And all that does is return the color. Great. If I call that method in my code, if I just look at how I'm developing my code and what the compiler might do, the compiler will say, okay, I need to create a stack frame, I need to call the method get color on that object, I then need to retrieve the value, I need to pop the stack frame off. So I've made a method call. But the compiler can be more clever about that, and it can say, well, so long as I only have one implementation of the get color method, I know that all that's going to happen is it returns that value. Even though it's private and it's encapsulated, because the compiler can respect the the contract we have between the code and the, the, the developer, it knows that in this particular case, we can simply eliminate the method call and effectively inline it by saying, well, just access the value in that object. And that removes the need for the stack frame. It removes the overhead of doing that. So this is, this is very good. It improves performance. But it only works if we have one implementation of get color. Now, Java as a language is dynamic, not in the sense of typing, but it is dynamic in the sense that you can load classes at runtime. And potentially we could load a subclass of animal, we could then override the get color method and it could change what that method does. So the way that the compiler would optimize code would have to change based on that. But we could still do that at runtime. Can't do it with static compilation, but we can do it with just-in-time compilation. 
So this is one simple example of a speculative optimization. We're speculating that we won't have a different implementation of get color. A second slightly more complex example of this is the idea of branch analysis. We have an if statement here, and I've created a, a slightly convoluted method, but it's good for demonstrating what this can actually do. My method is called compute magnitude, and it takes a value as a parameter. I've then got a conditional if statement which says if the value is greater than nine, I need to call another method called compute bias with the value to generate a value of my bias. Great. But if it's not greater than nine, I simply set bias to be one. And then I'm going to return the log base 10 of bias plus 99. Branch analysis says that in terms of profiling this code, what we're going to do is we're going to follow all the times that we go through that if statement, and we'll count how many times we go through the true branch, how many times we go through the false branch. If when we come to do JIT compilation on this, we look at the counters on that and we say, ah, we have never gone through the true branch of that if statement, then we could optimize based on the speculation that that will continue to be true in the future. So let's assume that because we haven't gone through the true branch in the past, we're not going to go through the true branch in the future. What the compiler can then do is be quite clever about this. It can say, OK, if the value is greater than 9, we still need to deal with that situation. At some point, we may get to a value greater than 9. If we do, we fall into a, an uncommon trap. An uncommon trap simply says, OK, we compiled based on this speculation. That speculation is actually false, so we have to throw away the code and recompile it. That's called a de-optimization, and it's really bad in terms of performance because you've compiled your code, thrown it away, and then having to recompile it again. But so long as our speculation holds true, we can optimize that by saying, well, if we know that the bias is always going to be 1, 1 plus 99 is 100, log base 10 of 100 is 2. So let's just eliminate all of that code and return 2. Great. So it avoids a lot of overhead. As I said, it's a slightly contrived example, but it does demonstrate how this kind of thing can greatly improve the code that you're generating. So speculative optimizations are very, very important. In fact, what we've done at Zool in terms of looking at the way the JIT compiler works is, in terms of the measurements we've made, over 50% of the performance gains we get from JIT are purely down to speculative optimizations. But they only work so long as you can de-optimize if your speculations turn out to be false. If you start using this in a static compiler and you say, OK, let's compile based on this way of doing things, you end up with situations that you simply can't handle. So it only really works if you've got the idea of a JIT compiler. De-optimizations, as I said, very bad for performance because you've already completed the compilation. You're then having to throw away that work. It's redundant. Then you have to recompile it so you're doing twice the amount of work that you were before. You also then have to fall back to a situation where you're either using interpreted mode or you go back to see one compiled code if you've still got that cached. So if we look at the, the sort of advantages and disadvantages of AOT versus JIT. AOT, OK, class, method, class loading prevents method inlining. That's a disadvantage. Uh, you've got no runtime bytecode generation. Some applications actually do this. They, they generate bytecodes as they're running. Reflection becomes very complicated. If you've tried doing reflection with Graal native images, you know that you basically have to declare all of the things you want to have reflection on ahead of time, and that makes life much more complicated as well. You can't use speculative optimization, and so the overall performance is typically going to be lower. On the JIT side of things, you can use aggressive method inlining, because we know exactly which class is loaded at runtime, which class is loaded when we're doing the JIT compilation. We can use runtime bytecode generation because we're interpreting bytecode, so that will work quite happily. Reflection is relatively simple because we have the ability to reflect on objects as we're using them. We can use speculative optimizations, and so the overall performance is typically going to be higher. On the downside, or the, the upside of AOT, 
Obviously, you get the full speed at start, and you don't have the overhead on the CPU to do the compilation. Versus on JIT, you still require that warm-up time, and you do have the CPU overhead to do your compilation. So, if we look at the differences between ahead-of-time compile code and JIT compile code, using our simplified graph here, the optimum level of performance we're going to get with JIT compile code is this level here. Compare that with AOT, compiled code, natively compiled static code, it's going to be at a lower level. You won't be able to get the same number of advantages in terms of those speculative optimizations. Even if you feed in profile-guided optimization to try and generate a better result, what you're going to see is something like this. It'll raise it, but it won't be as high as you will get with JIT compilation. JIT compilation is always going to give you a better overall performance level than you'll get with static compilation. So what about a different approach to solving the whole problem? And this is where this idea of crack comes in. If you look at Linux, there is a set of technologies that have been developed, which is called coordinated resume in user space. And in terms of trying to pronounce that as a single word, you come up with cryo. It's not a particularly nice word, but you know, it's you know, cryo. And it's a Linux project. The idea being that you can freeze a running application. If you think about it, it sort of makes sense because at any point when you're running an application, you will have a program counter, which points to the execution of the, the um, instruction which is being executed at that point in time. And you will have a set of registers, you will have a stack which has information in it, you will have other areas of memory that are being used. So there is a, a finite set of state which is associated with the running application. And at any point, you could take that state, make a copy of it, and then at some point later, you could simply say, OK, well, let's start from where the program counter is, have everything restored to where it is. It's essentially the same as swapping out a process and swapping in a process. That's basically the, the same idea. So we could create a snapshot of running application, and then we could restart it at some point later. But rather than doing it at the kernel level, where we're doing this swapping out of a process, and swapping it back in, what we're effectively doing is saying, right, write all that information out to a file or a set of files, and then when you want to restart it, read those files back in. So using the diagram here of, of the sort of basic von Neumann machine, we've got our input, we've got our output, and then in the middle we've got this set of state which represents the registers, the stack, the other memory that's in use, and so on. So it is the idea that we could take this set of information and again, rather than doing it at the kernel level where we're fixed on the machine we're running on, we could take that set of files and move them to a different machine and then say, OK, let's restart that application from the same point as long as we've got the same architecture and we can replicate the things we need for that machine. We could take those files and we could restart it on a different machine or we could restart it multiple times because we can just copy the files to wherever we need them. Even on the same machine, we could duplicate them and so on. So if you look at the details of Cryo, what you'll find is that most of it, as you would expect, is implemented in user space. Coordinated resume in user space kind of gives it away. But there are a few things that are needed at the kernel level to do this. Um, those have been in the kernel since 3.11, so they've been around for quite a long time. The main goal behind this project was to allow containers to be moved around. So you could take the state of a running application and then move it to uh, containers for microservices and have that done in a much easier way. And it does support quite an extensive set of features in terms of the things that you can actually maintain the state of. Clearly, you've got the processes that are involved, you've got the threads within those processes. You've got all of the application memory, even memory map files, shared memory, all of those things can be replicated. The open files, pipes, FIFOs, sockets, all of the typical things you'd be using, even inter-process communication channels, timers, and signals. And they've even included a way of being able to rebuild a TCP connection from one side without the need to actually exchange messages between the two. So you're basically rebuilding it from one side of the connection. So this all sounds quite interesting. Why not simply apply it to a Java application? If you think about it, the JVM is simply 
an application that runs in user space. So why shouldn't we just take Cryo and say, take my running JVM, take a snapshot of it, and then restart it again later on? Could work. But we have some challenges with that. So the, the problem is that if we move same state to a different machine, what happens with open files? What happens with open network connections? Especially files. So if, you, if you've got an open file on one machine and you try and move it to another machine, you're not going to have the same open file connection on the new machine. That becomes very complicated. So shared memory as well. If you're going to move between different machines, that could be uh, difficult. Even if you, you have a period of time between when you stop the application and when you restart it, having those things uh, maybe disappear or file changes, network connections, timeout, whatever, those things become very difficult to restart if all you do is just take a snapshot of what's actually being involved there. So JVM, Java code, the idea here is to say, OK, let's assume it was continuous tasks and things become very difficult for it. We need a, a better way of dealing with that. So this is where we come to this idea of coordinated restore checkpoint. And the, the kind of key thing here is coordinated. Why don't we make the application aware that it is about to be checkpointed? So we have our application running, and we decide that we want to make a checkpoint of that application. We can either do it externally by saying, sending a signal to the JVM to say, I want a snapshot of this machine. Or we could do it programmatically within our own code and say, I want to take a snapshot at this point. When we know that we're going to be snapshotted, then we're aware of that, and we can call methods to tidy up. We can make sure that if we've got open files, we actually close those before we take the snapshot. If we've got open network connections, we can close those. We can do various things to tidy up what we're doing in such a way that we can let that application sort of pause, so we'll put it into hibernation mode. Then when we start it up again, we're aware that we're being started up. So the, from the application's point of view, it sees a signal to say, we're about to be snapshotted, and then the very next thing it will see, even though it could be a period of time between that, is a, a signal to say, you have just been woken up. At which point, the application could go, ah, right, so I did a shutdown for the snapshot, I closed these files, I closed these network connections, I need to then open those files again. I need to open those network connections again, re-establish those things. And it can do it in a way which means that you can do like things like uh, checking the uh, sort of um, the SHA code on a, a file just to see if it's changed. You can deal with re-establishing a network connection in a, in a controlled way, all of those sorts of things. But then the application can continue running from that point knowing that it's re-established re all the things it needs to do that safely. So what we do with, with Crack is we allow you to do that, but we also enforce some more restrictions on you because to make it more safe in terms of what you're able to do. When you make a snapshot, if there are any open file descriptors, if there are any open sockets, network connections, we will not allow you to do a snapshot. So you do have to tidy up all of those things. So sockets, files have to be closed before you can do a snapshot. And so the checkpoint will be aborted if it finds any open connections. So the Crack API is really quite straightforward. What we do is we implement the idea of an interface called a resource. And by doing it as an interface, it means that any class that you've got can implement this interface. We don't have to extend another class. We simply say, add this interface, implement that, and that has two methods associated with it, before checkpoint, after restore. So these are callback methods so that your code, the classes which have open files, network connections, whatever, they will implement these methods so that when you get called the before checkpoint, what happens is it says, right, we're about to do a checkpoint, close that file. Then when we get after restore, that method gets called and the code, your class can then say, oh, right, so I'm being restored, let's have that file reopened, deal with it in whichever way needs to be uh, handled in, in that way. So very simple, two methods, all we need to do. Then in terms of actually using that, what we do is we say, OK, we've got resources, we implement that as an interface, then we have to register those resources so those callback methods can be used. 
To do that, we use a context. Context is simply an abstract class which we've implemented, and you can, get, you can either implement it yourself if you really wanted to, or we have a core class which will provide you with the default context for your application. That way, all you need to do is when you create a class which implements the resource interface, you can then register it with the context, and that way the Checkpoint Restore system has a list of all classes which have uh, or, or resources, and it can call the, the methods in the, the right sequence for that. So in terms of how we use that, we simply have core, get the global context. That gives us context. We can then call the register method with our resources, register them, and have them made available for this. So how we use that is, like I said, we, the context will maintain a list of resource objects. When we do the before checkpoint, all the, all the resources that we have, the before checkpoint method of each of those will be called in turn. When we do the after restore, quite importantly, we do the, the calling of those methods in the reverse order. So if you think you've got A, B, C, we'll call the before checkpoint on A, then B, then C. When we come back out of the checkpoint and we do the restore, we'll call the restore, after restore method on C, then B, then A. That way it allows you to, to actually order things so you can tidy up things in a particular sequence and then you can do the reverse on the other side. So if you have to have one file open before you can go to the next one, it allows you to do that thing. It gives you a predictable order in terms of the restoration, which is quite important. As a simple example, um, just a, a Jetty server. So we create a class, server manager, we've got a server. And then in this case, all we're doing is we're saying, OK, we're going to listen on a particular port. And we've got a handler. So create a new server on port 8080 set the handler for that as the server, and start the server. Great. If we want to do or create a snapshot of that, we can do it externally, as I said. And we do that through J command. J command on our example jetty jar file, and we then use the jdk.checkpoint command to send to the JDK or the JVM, and that will then initiate the checkpoint for that and generate the files for us. And what we'll see is that the command executed successfully. Except it didn't. <laughs> so this is one of those things that we, we do need to fix. Because that's what you're going to get back. You're going to say, yes, command executed successfully, except if you look in the log file, you'll see that actually, no, it didn't. Because we had an open socket, because we didn't do anything in terms of shutting down our server. So the server was still running. We said, in terms of crack, we don't allow that. So it would abort, and it wouldn't create a checkpoint for us. What we then need to do is go back in and we say, OK, our server manager implements the resource interface. And so we now have our before checkpoint and after restore methods. And that allows us to stop the server in the before checkpoint. And then it also allows us to start the server again in the after restore. And when we create a new instance of this, we'll get the global context and we'll register this particular object with the context so that these methods actually get called. It's very straightforward, very simple API. If you want to initiate the checkpoint programmatically, then again, you can use the core class and you can call within your code checkpoint restore at that point. So what you're going to see is you call checkpoint restore. Obviously, it will go off, it will do the checkpoint. And then when you do the restore by starting the application up again, you'll come back to that point and you'll continue your code from there. So this, this checkpoint restore actually does both. And it's the point in your code where you will actually pause the application. Can throw an exception. You can either get a checkpoint exception if things are not shut down properly, or you get a restore exception if there's some issue with not being able to start up the restore properly. How good is it? Does it actually work? Well, what we've done is to create a proof of concept implementation of this. And Garrett's going to show you this in a moment. But to give you some idea of the way this performs, what we did was we ran a number of different things. And we looked at, OK, run something on a machine and measure how much time it takes to get to the first operation. Spring Boot. Lots of people use Spring Boot. So we ran that. And on the machine that we ran it on, it took, let's call it four seconds to get to the first operation in terms of the Spring Boot thing. Using a checkpoint and then a restore, 
38 milliseconds. So that's two orders of magnitude faster in terms of getting to the, the first operation. And remember that this also, if you've run it for long enough, it's warmed up, and so you don't have to go through that whole method analysis, you don't have to go through the whole compilation thing, you're already executing fully optimized code right from the very beginning. So you've suddenly got 38 milliseconds to get your application up and running versus four seconds. We did Micronaut, that was about a second it took to get to first execution, and again, it was sort of 48, 46 milliseconds. Quarkus, which you know, sells itself as super fast startup, okay, that took less than a second startup, only 980 milliseconds. We can do it in 33 milliseconds. So really, really super fast startup. And then possibly not the best example, XML transform, that was again four and a half seconds down to 53 milliseconds. So definitely two orders of magnitude better. The other thing is how long it takes to get results and the, the overhead of the compilation thing. So if you look at this graph, what we're seeing, the, the red graph is showing the OpenJDK and how long it takes to, to actually uh, process the number of transactions. So we're not having that overhead in terms of the CPU load. When we use a checkpoint, we immediately go into fully optimized code. So we're right from the very beginning, we're optimizing and we're actually delivering on the performance we need. So we see a reduction in time to complete a certain number of transactions. Same thing with uh, Quarkus, slightly bigger differential just because of the profile of the application, different code needed to be compiled and so on. So to summarize this part of the, the presentation, basically crack is, a, is an interesting way to pause a JVM-based application. The idea is that you can be aware that you're about to be checkpointed, you can be aware that you're being restored, and so you can take that code and potentially you can move it to a different machine as long as the architecture is the same. You could start it up multiple times because there's no reason why you couldn't do that, especially because you are coordinated in terms of the restore. So you could actually look to see if this is you know, something that you're starting up again. Benefit is obviously potentially very, very fast startup times. Eliminates the whole idea of the compilation, the JIT compilation side of thing, the warm up, all of that goes away, and you get the improved throughput from the start. Now, what we've done is create this as an OpenJDK project. So go to OpenJDK, and you'll see on the left hand side there's a list of projects, one of which is Crack. And there's a couple of links here. Uh, there's a wiki page that we've got, and there's also a GitHub repo that's got the code for this plus the code for the benchmarks that we did so you can set those up and you can run them yourself if you want to. So with that I'm going to invite Garrett to come up here and we'll just switch over laptops. Can you, yeah, fit, won't it? yeah, there we go. Somebody needs to do something. See, technical stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, too technical. Uh, yeah, what is third, <laughs> yeah, third level support needs to be called. <laughs> ah, two buttons. Two, uh, two buttons, of course. So yeah, so we. I will just show you a little demo. It's uh, it's pretty simple. Just let me explain it first. So we, you see two terminal windows here, and on the left side I just started. What I literally do is just call Java with some specific parameters to tell Java where to store the checkpointed files, and then I start the jar file. But I just put it in, in a shell script, and the checkpoint script does the J command thing. Right? So it's just easier to, to watch it. And what it does is, it's um, I created a little program. I think, I think you need a little... It doesn't work. Oh, I, I can't on, on the virtual machine, sorry. Here we go. So is it better? Yeah. Okay. So um, the code is as follows. So I just, I have a scheduled task. Every five seconds, it calls a method. And in that method, it just runs 100,000 times through a loop and checks random numbers between one and 100,000 
for Prime. And every time it does the check, it first checks a cache. Is it in the cache? Then it takes it from the cache. And if not, it checks for Prime and put it in the cache. So the result will be, if I start it, then you will see it, the first run takes a long time. The cache is empty, you have to fill it up, so then. And the cache has a special feature, it forgets the numbers. After 60 seconds, it will just remove uh, numbers from the cache. So this, is, in principle, I would, what I would like to demonstrate is the application warm-up time. So because usually you fill up caches and maps and all these kind of things, take some time, and this is the, the thing that we will see. So it will just print out something like, numbers of um, numbers in the cache and then how much time it took and then the time first will be around 30 seconds and then we'll go down to 10 seconds and then we will come into milliseconds and at that point I will create a checkpoint and then we will restart from there and then we can see the difference okay so let's start it and like I said you see the pit on the upper left it's it's 66 59 and then now it, it it's calculating it's filling the cache like I said it's 30 seconds if I run that on the M1 Mac, it's 1.3 seconds, but here it's, a, it's an older one because we only have OpenJDK version for Linux x64 at the moment. So you can't run it on another platform, which is the reason why I have the virtual machine on my Mac, which makes it a little bit slower. Oh, here we go. So first run was 27 seconds, 63,000 elements in the cache. And so now the next run, you will see it will, it will be faster, around 10 seconds, and now it will go... Bup, 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 both buttons, you have it to press them both. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's worth mentioning that, um, that this builds on Cryo, doesn't it? So we're using Cryo underneath. Yes, which is we, why we use Linux Cryo under, yes, underneath, and that's the reason for it. And you see already now it's calling every five milliseconds. Here at run number 12, this, it's a little bit slower, and now it will go down to around 40. And then when we reach that point, I will just create the checkpoint. And now you see the cache is filled 99.9%, so which means we have a balance. It will be around 40 milliseconds. So let's just create the checkpoint here. You see on the right side it says checkpoint, successfully ex uh, executed the command, and you see the pit. So this is the, the pit, right? And you can imagine that because we, we have this pit, we can't start the same thing multiple times on one machine. So the idea is if you put that in a Docker container, the warmed up image, then you can start up the Docker containers really quickly because it's always warmed up and it will always start from that point. So this is, but there's one thing that I have to mention here. I told you that the cache will forget after 60 seconds the numbers, right? So each number is a timestamp in the cache. And every time I contact the cache, it checks, oh, this is outdated and removes it. So you know, we, we, we stop this, the whole thing. Next time I start it, first time it will call the cache, the cache will check against the timestamps and he will say oh that's everything is older than 60 seconds and just remove everything so it would start from scratch so this is the stuff you have to take away it will be aware of right so what I did before I create the checkpoint I just store the current timestamp in a variable and this one will be checkpointed next time I start up I just compare the, the this timestamp when I saved it with the current timestamp and just add the delta to all values in the cache and then it's up to date again. Just this is the stuff you can run into, right? So it's not that easy if you handle stuff with dates and times. Just keep in mind when you checkpoint it, you checkpoint this point in time. So you have to make sure that if you restore it, you always update the stuff. So let's, let's restore it. So it's, um, it's just another script and you will see there is something like the number of runs so the last one was 16, so it should start from 17, and you will see that the, this, the time for restarting is yep, 35 milliseconds, here we go. So right, it, and we, we waited some time, and now it stay at that level, and the JIT's still running, so if we now would do something, it will optimize the code, and this is the, the big benefit here. And I can stop again, and now say, oh, let's restore one more time, and you will see it will again go from 17. Here you go, same thing. Because what it does, it just loads the stuff from the files into memory. And the whole startup time is more or less the time it takes to load the stuff from the files into memory and restore all the resources that you have. Means if you have a lot of resources like database connections and all that, might take a little bit longer, but still it's in the millisecond range. 
So, and this is the, the biggest advantage. And let me show you just because I had this question last time, is what is the size of the files? Um, here we go. It's the biggest files is around 31 megabytes here. Of course, if you have a large application, this file will be bigger. But still, I mean, in the times of SSD, this is quite fast. And I can always restart this thing now. If you create a Docker container from this set of, of uh, checkpointed files, you can start up your Docker container like that. It's always, and it's always the same range. You see, in mine was around 36 milliseconds. You saw the Spring Boot thing was 38. This is only loading time. And that's the big benefit that we see here. So I think, yeah, that's it. Okay. So, yeah, okay, so that, that, that's the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. Oh, uh, oh. and just one more time. Yep. I, I want to think, I just the forgot the, the code for that stuff. If you would like to play around with that, it's all, you can find it on GitHub. If you would like to know where it is, just ask me, right? So we have the demos there, so you can just play around. And it's interesting to, to play around with this stuff. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And we, we do have a few minutes for questions, if anybody does have a question. How do you handle locks if you're checkpointing? Right, so how do we handle locks if we're checkpointing? Um, Never tried. <laughs> 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 um, I think locks, locks shouldn't be an issue because they're internal to the JVM. So it's part of the state of the JVM, in which yeah. case it's self-contained. So locks outside of the JVM, so if you're talking about like database locks or, or things like that, those would need to be handled in the checkpoint restore um, actions. But within the JVM itself, locks are, are just part of the state, so I don't see any issue with that. Question in the back. Yes. So, th so the question is: um, th Is this just a research project? Do we have any ideas about what ver what version of Java um, we could apply this to, and so on? Um, it is very much still a research project. Um, we have interest from other sort of companies. So Red Hat have expressed an interest in working on us, working with us on this. Also, IBM have uh, had a chat with us. Um, I know that. In terms of our proof of concept, yes, it, it, it's very nice. We can demonstrate lots of interesting things on there, but it's not quite production ready yet. And uh, we have started talking to Oracle about this as whether it's possible to get it into the, the main line for the JVM itself. The, the drawback that we have at the moment is that because it builds on Cryo, it is very Linux specific. There isn't a way of doing it on Windows. There isn't a way of doing it on Mac. And because Java is cross-platform, we can't provide an implementation which is only on one platform. So that's the biggest uh, hurdle that I can think of to why we can't get it into the mainstream at the moment is because there isn't a cross-platform way of doing this. Technically, you could argue, well, we could just have a no-op if it's on a platform that doesn't support it, but that's not really good enough. We, we, if we're going to do it as part of Java, it needs to be something that's across uh, different platforms. So that's really the biggest hurdle we have at the moment. What we might do as a company is all, we might do this as a sort of like our own thing that uh, we can provide to people and they can use it for their applications on Linux only. So uh, that's unfortunately the best I can answer on that. And yep. Yeah, so, so the question is about if you have a pod of <coughs> nodes running in a cluster and you want to be able to start up the application very quickly, but you don't want the same state for all of those nodes. Yeah, that is, that is problematic, you see, because what you'd really need to do in that situation is, is actually create checkpoints for each of the nodes in your cluster. So you would need to start up the whole cluster, have each node generate its own checkpoint, so it's got its own state, and then when you restarted the whole a cluster, you could do it with individual nodes. So it would be more complicated, but it could certainly be done. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit more involved um, in, in that sense, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, okay, so the question is what happens if the code changes? 
totally invalidates the uh, the checkpoint because we it, it's the same. We we can't uh, have the ability to change code and then be able to use a, a checkpoint. It just doesn't work in that sense. It, it is tied very much to a, a fixed state in terms of the application. I get what you're saying with CI/CD. That that's all. You know, we we use that a lot, but uh, this is designed for situations where you are going to use the same application multiple times without making changes to it. Um, one more question, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So yeah, so, so the question is, what if you have um, like different times when your application is being used? So you're talking about market application, financial, pre-market, open market, during the market type thing. So let's say three different situations. What I would suggest at that point is to create three different snapshots. So you have a, a snapshot before the market, snapshot at open market, snapshot during market. And that way, if you need to restart or start up new instances, you pick which snapshot to use because it's optimized for that particular time of your application. So th there are ways of working around it, but I get what you're saying as well. The, the nice thing about this, of course, is that if you would start the snapshot pre-market, it will respond in exactly the same way of recompiling because it's just a running application. So again, there are sort of ways around that. Um, and and when you're restoring, sorry, but when you're restoring, you can define where it should take the files from, right? So you can store them in different folders and then if you restore the pre-market, you just point it to the folder and then it restore that from this checkpoint. Could have it on one disk, but in different folders. Mm. So that's possible. Okay, and we have now run out of time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. Yeah.